Maxim? Video of Fianum, bandwidth Corinonda, Larum video of Fianum, they with Mutum Gianum. Hello. Ah, Maxim. Ah, okay. Start here. Start here, start here. Good morning, everyone. Castle Goat Birders Club, for the first time, we are conducting a NVNR session on birding, a thrilling hobby. So this is the first time we are uh, going to conduct a webinar uh, online session. So today, we have planned a topic named uh, birding a thrilling hobby. So today, uh, Prashant Krishna MC will be uh, giving a talk over birding and uh, uh, and its related its uh, hobby and uh, related things. He will be uh, discussing. Prashant Krishna MC is an avid bird watcher who is native to Posadigumpe in North Kasaragod which is a well-known location for raptors in the district Kasaragod. He is actually interested and having a great knowledge of various fields in wildlife, including especially snakes, amphibians, and spiders. He is also part of Team Saliga, who are keen interested with spiders and been conducting several workshops since a couple of months. He worked as a coordinator for a great citizen science project named Kasaragod Bird Atlas. He is an amazing photographer too. He is currently working in BASF India Limited in Mangalore. Today, I welcome Prashant Krishna MC, who is also a founder member of Kasaragod Birders Club, to take up this session on birding a thrilling hobby. He will be talking, taking all of you to the beautiful world of winged creatures. Thank you. It's uh -huh. over to you, Prashant Krishna. Thank you, Maxim. Uh, thank you uh, for a wonderful introduction. And uh, I will start my uh, PPT now. So uh, welcome all for uh, this session. I am not an expert bird watcher, but uh, uh, I'm an uh, I'm an interested interested in bird watching since uh, almost uh, eight years now. So I have been documenting birds and uh, their behaviors in uh, uh, mainly Kasargod district of Kerala and also uh, Dakshina Kannada district of uh, uh, Karnataka. So. Uh, the over, over the years, I have doc, uh, seen some of the interesting behaviors and I have read about uh, bird behaviors and also I have attended uh, many sessions about bird behaviors. So uh, that kind of knowledge uh, I thought of sharing uh, with you all. So today I am doing that. And that's why I gave the name Birding a Thrilling Hobby. Uh, Initially, uh, I was into birding because of my uh, one of my senior, Vinit Kumar. He was a uh, zoology student and I was a chemistry student. But uh, due to my interest towards nature, I uh, gradually hook up with uh, zoology students and uh, I started birding. So uh, he taught me the first lessons of uh, uh, bird watching, bird identification and photography. And uh, later I started uh, by myself and uh, uh, gradually uh, with the Kasaragod birders, I mean Maxim and uh, Raju sir and many others, I can name many and uh, with them uh, we have done a lot of things in Kasaragod. So, uh, so 
birding actually is a thrilling hobby for me and when you start birding maybe uh, we have some beginners in this group or maybe a few uh, elder bird watchers who are more experienced than me and uh, uh, but still i am definitely sure that if you start bird watching then it will become a habit for you i mean I, in the sense you can't ignore birds uh, whenever you go for uh, uh, field visits or uh, if you are doing some other work then again you will be searching for birds or so you will be hearing some calls and try to identifying that calls so uh, here uh, you can see a small girl and she's uh, my cousin and she's also interested in bird watching now uh, she doesn't know uh, the difference between uh, many birds but she can definitely identify some sunbirds because uh, regularly sunbirds visit her home and uh, she sees them a lot during her uh, uh, breakfast and dinner time so what is birding uh birding is uh, mean by uh watching and observing the birds and uh, there is no specific place for that you can do birding anywhere uh, i mean near your home or you can go to forest or or you can go near the beach and uh, what mainly is needed is uh, the enthusiasm towards the birding and also the interest then you can see birds anywhere near uh, wherever you are so there is no age limit at all even the uh, uh, small children or uh, maybe the aged ones can do the bird watching and it's i can say for sure it's very relaxing hobby because uh, uh, nowadays life is becoming more stressful i mean uh, even the uh, covid situation and other things uh they are making our lives more difficult and in this situation when we want some uh, peace of mind we can go for birding and when you look at this beautiful creature our mind will become calm down and uh, we will get that peace of mind what we were looking for so uh, what do you need for birding uh, that's the main question whenever uh, uh, we start birding we will get that question what do you need for birding usually birding doesn't need anything i can say that and but for uh, making it more uh, improved kind you will need some binoculars or cameras etc etc and a pair of binocular i mean uh, when you start birding you just uh, look the bird near your home or uh, which, which will be passing inside uh, your garden and later on when you go for field you will see a bird uh, flying in a higher distance or uh, a bird perching in a, a very uh, large dist uh, distant tree then you want to see that bird then you will uh, need some tools for uh, seeing that uh, for that you can go for binocular or uh, camera camera is uh,
and even you can uh, draw some uh, bird uh, sketches the previous days in the olden days you you might be knowing our uh, bird man of india is uh, the uh, dr salim ali he used to do drawing and after that after so many years the camera photography method started and uh, i am not into the conversation of cons and pros of uh, this photography but still when you do the actual uh, drawing thing you will come to know lot about the uh, organism itself so i think that's the best way to learn their behaviors and uh, one very important thing is whenever you go for birding you just have to note down everything i mean uh, if you are seeing a peacock uh, in the right side you can see a uh, pea fowl and if you are seeing a pea fowl and uh, if it is opening its train i mean it is attracting its female uh, attracting females then you have to observe at what time it is doing what what is the uh, weather condition there is is it rain or is it a sunny day like that you can note down so uh, that at that moment of time you don't uh, you may not get uh, that importance of you, your writings but after uh, some time you will get to know uh, what is the behavior and how the environmental factors are relating to that behavior so that's the thing and next thing you need is a field guide maybe the beginners who want to uh, identify the birds will uh, nowadays definitely there are a lot of sources like uh, our facebook groups and uh, uh, whatsapp whatsapp platforms there are many options like that and uh, definitely you can go for field guides where photos of the birds and their di distribution their uh, their uh, peculiar behavior uh, all things are mentioned and uh, you can get a lot of things from field guides and even i started uh, my birding and uh, i brought uh, a field guide of uh, birds of indian subcontinent by uh, uh, inskip inskip and inskip so and i also had uh, birds of india uh, by Sal dr salim ali so both the book i was referring and uh, i was uh, saying that uh, uh, our what uh, facebook group indian birds there daily there, there are uh, there will be lot of photos up, updating so you can come to know different species of birds through them so the main thing what you need for birding is just enthusiasm for uh, learning more things about birding and also the patience patience is very important because uh, uh, whenever you go for field uh, you should not uh, go in hurry bury i mean uh, you should not disturb the uh, environment so that the birds will get distracted by your presence and they will fly away so that should not happen just you have to go with uh, go with very carefulness and uh, you have to wait for wait to observe some behavioral uh, tactics very patiently and also for photography the patience is very uh, important because uh, only uh, if you wait for an hour or so you will get some beautiful shots of the bird so that's about uh, that's bird. hello hello Sanda. hello shamita one, one minute uh -huh. yeah okay. um uh, the voice is breaking continuously who oh, is it uh... oh. my network is since the connection i think connection yeah, is yeah. a little little problem okay. voice is breaking continuously uh -huh. now now is it audible now it is all audible yeah okay okay so uh, yeah i think network issues there but i will try my level best here and now uh, okay. what is okay. a bird shamita is it okay now it is it is okay it is okay now. okay okay and uh, what is a bird that uh, we have to again there is problem prashant again there is problem a little bit okay
So Hello. Hello, Shamit. Yeah. 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 Uh, now it's better. It's okay. Better. Uh, still, the message is coming. Your internet connection is unstable because. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think. I think it is breaking a little bit. Uh, it is not in a full sentence. That is a problem. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. So. I now also have... there is problem. Uh huh. So we'll see. Uh, I don't have any other option now because I think uh, here the network is very. Yeah, it, now, it, now it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I will continue. Uh, if you want to stop me in between, you can stop, and I can repeat that uh, thing. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. okay. Continue. Yeah. 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 So, uh, what is a bird? so that uh, we have to know in the beginning itself because uh, whenever we go for birding with the, our uh, fellow birders if uh, if they are know they are knowing something about the bird and if they are telling something about the bird itself uh, then you must understand what they are telling so basically uh, there are few things you have to look into the bird to identify them so uh, i think you can see my mouse cursor here uh, the head portion of the bird yes, is called yes. yeah okay head portion of the bird is called crown so uh, there are a lot of uh, different shapes and patterns of crown so that uh, some individuals can be identified uh, one example is red whiskered bulbul it is having a slightly elongated crown blackish elongated crown and uh, another factor is the beak uh, the shape of the beak or bill so uh, the bill is uh, divided into two parts upper mandible and lower mandible and the color of uh, the two uh, parts will be uh, different in some species and uh, same in some species so that's also a key feature for identification and uh, again one more thing is the supercilium the part above the eye is the supercilium so uh, there are few individuals where you can identify them by looking at the color of the supercilium or the presence of the supercilium uh, because in some birds the supercilium may be absent or in some bird supercilium may be present that is the id character of that bird and uh, next is uh, there are a lot of uh, things here but uh, uh, i will uh, tell about important things and you can uh, look at the belly color i mean abdomen uh, the breast region and the belly region the uh, thigh region and the tarsus and the vent vent is very important here uh, the uh, underside of the uh, uh, bird and uh, it is also having different colors in uh, different birds so uh, that's also uh, that also helps in identifying lot of birds and so uh, the tail uh, in some uh, cases uh, you will see larger tail and in uh, you might be knowing the racket tail drongo the uh, there are two elongated feathers in that uh, bird so that's that's an id characteristic and uh, but if you see some uh, juvenile uh, racketdel drongo you won't see uh, that kind of elongated uh, feathers but the tail itself the tail end itself suggest uh, the bird species i mean uh, the forkness of the tail uh, how it is bent uh, like that you can understand a uh, bit by bit by learning uh, about the structure of tail so uh, next thing you want to know is uh, the uh, mantle mantle is the upper part of the uh, bird uh, i mean i can say uh, the back of the bird 
so uh, that's also having different colors in uh, different birds and also uh, if you are uh, looking at pipits you have to see stripe stripes over the mantle and uh, spots over the mantle like that so that's also an important character and uh, next if you look at wings there are uh, you can see the primaries the primaries will reach up to the tail in some birds and uh, it won't reach up to the uh, tail tip like this uh, so uh, these are the first set of uh, uh, feathers flight feathers these are the primaries and uh, the next set of the feathers are secondaries and here there are greater coverts median coverts and lesser coverts lesser coverts are very much close to the body of the bird and median coverts they they are small small birds they small feathers and the uh, primary primaries are the largest feathers so uh, most of the time Uh, by looking at the color of the primaries and the length of the primaries uh, uh, we can identify certain species of the bird and the rum the uh, vent is the uh, part below the abdomen region and that is underside of the bird and above that i mean opposite side you can see the rum so uh, in some birds like uh, uh, red rum put swallow and all you can see the actual reddish feathers in rump area so that's also an uh, important uh, characteristic so uh, next thing is nape nape is uh, like this is crown and uh, this is neck region of the bird i can say and this area the neck region of that uh, uh, bird is called nape so uh, lesser yellow nape woodpecker if you know then you can ident uh, you can imagine what is what exactly is nape that a lesser yellow nape is having yellowish color in the nape area i mean neck area so uh, that's also an important characteristics characteristic and uh, yeah i think uh, ear covers and all they are uh, not required that much these are the main char characteristics uh, you can consider crown the bill shape and uh, this uh, abdomen region uh, tarsus vent under tail covers primaries tail rump back mantle and nape you can uh, just try to remember that okay and uh, about evolution of birds uh, actually the birds were uh, uh, said to be evolved from uh, uh, the ancestors like serpents serpents i mean by snakes and uh, 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 other uh, reptiles so uh, in the dinosaurus era uh, previously it was thought that archaeopteryx is the origin original form of a bird i mean uh, in the dinosaurus age uh, they found archaeopteryx uh, fossil so they thought only the archaeopteryx was uh, its original uh, from where uh, the bird got evolved but recent uh, uh, fossil studies proved that uh, this cynosopteryx prima and uh, uh, some other individuals other paleontological individuals they also proved to be an ancestors for even archaeopteryx so uh, uh, they started evolving like uh, they uh, their toes previously the uh, dinosaurs were having five toes and later uh, they uh, uh, became three toes and the median toe became in, uh, elongated like that uh, when you see the birds now you can uh, correlate that uh, thing with the earlier uh, the serpents so uh, it ichthyornis disper is uh, the paleontological uh, thing what Uh, uh scientists got recently and it is almost like uh, uh this uh, prehistoric uh, birds so after that after the winged birds evolved there were lot of uh, co evolution or uh, extra evolution and from that the wingless birds uh, evolved i mean uh, if you are thinking that uh, wing wingless birds evolved 
before the wing, winged bird or flight bird, uh, which uh, the birds which can fly, but it's not like that. The birds uh, which can fly evolved first, and after many evolution, then uh, the uh, the birds which cannot fly, like penguin and other birds, evolved. So uh, there are a lot of theories regarding that, and uh, it's some uh, slightly complicated thing. So uh, we'll move to uh, identifying birds. Uh, I just told you about uh, the parts of the bird, and uh, while uh, when we try to identify birds, uh, we can check for a few characteristics like color, color of the birds, and pattern. Uh, patterns of the birds. I mean, what pattern you can see over the bird, shape of the bird, and size of the bird. Especially, shape and size gives a lot of information about the species. And uh, just for example, if you consider a uh, uh, red red whiskered bulbul, or uh, I can say house sparrow for the bigness. House sparrow is very small bird, and it's having a lot of patterns. I mean, uh, the color is brown and lot of uh, markings all over its body and you can definitely uh, differentiate it from uh, red whiskered bulbul red whiskered bulbul is having brownish body but that brown is completely different from the brown of uh, uh, house sparrow so like that you can differentiate even the size and shape also matters so uh, shape in the sense uh, uh, some birds are slightly uh, looks like elongated birds and uh, some birds are uh, slightly roundish birds so like that you can differentiate and uh, based on their flight also you can differentiate uh, and that's not easy for the beginners i can say uh, because each bird will have some specific kind of flight uh, if you look at uh, the flight of uh, uh, woodpecker they will have undulating flight I mean, uh, they will go down once, they will climb up once, like that they will fly. And if you uh, see red whiskered bulbul, they fly uh, like uh, in a uh, uh, straight way. Uh, I mean, uh, they don't have undulating flight. So uh, if you look at vernal hanging parrot, their flight is different. Like that, you can differentiate them by flight. And based on their calls, and most of the birds have different different calls and uh, uh, birds are, almost all birds are vocal so uh, when you learn about bird calls you can definitely try to id them by uh, hearing the calls and uh, next thing is uh, based on their nests and uh, i don't suggest uh, to do this because if you go and disturb the nest that will be a threat for bird but even though if you see some nest near your uh, house or uh, inside uh, some forest or in your garden then uh, you can definitely identify which uh, the shape of the nest and uh, by looking at the materials used for building that nest you can identify what kind of uh, bird made that nest uh, usually uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, red whiskered bulbul nests in our uh, in our surroundings and uh, nowadays i i saw a lot of black naped monarch nests uh, uh, posted in uh, facebook and other groups and especially when you go for birding you must know what kind of habitat you are entering into i mean if you are entering into wetland then you you wetland uh, i think all of you know about wetland wetlands are the areas where uh, water uh, will be logged in i mean for uh, most of most part of the year water will be there uh, and only in the uh, hot summer or maybe during uh, may april may time uh, the uh, wetlands some part of the wetlands will be dried up so uh, if you are going to a wetland kind of habitat you must know what kind of birds you are searching for at that place so then only uh, you you will be successful in identifying birds there because uh, if you go to forest and if you uh, think of getting some wetland birds there then definitely uh, it will cost you a lot of time so and also the different habitat tells about the different species you can get there in forest there are forest endemics endemics means the uh, only the uh, 
birds which can be seen in that area so for there are forest endemic forest endemics which doesn't come to coastal area or wetland like area so like that and also there are uh, uh, quite a number of ground dwelling birds uh, like uh, uh, babblers or uh, 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 thrushes wagtails and all uh, they usually do, uh, don't sit on a large tree or a canopy kind of thing uh so uh, you can distinguish arboreal birds arboreal birds means which like to sit on a, a canopy large tree and hunt on that uh, kind of a thing so you can distinguish them and uh, the aquatic birds i already told about uh, wetland birds uh, the same same thing uh, aquatic birds are the birds which require water for uh, uh, feeding or uh, their behavior they require water so uh, i will just mention about some of uh, common birds around us uh, the first one is uh, cattle egret you can identify cattle egret by looking at the legs and the feet uh, the leg color usually will be uh, darker i mean blackish and the feet will be yellowish in color and uh, you sh you must observe how much part of the leg is yellow when you look at uh, these kind of egrets because uh, if you if you see western reef egret that uh, the feet of that bird will also be slightly yellowish and that yellow will uh, uh, move up to uh, the uh, the this uh, small length of the leg also not uh, it is not restricted to, uh, to the feet and in cattle egrets it's restricted to the feet that yellowness so you can uh, id cattle egrets by that and uh, the second one is uh, uh, common ayora ayora is a uh, yellow uh, yellow colored bird which is very uh, uh, small actually but uh, you can hear its call a lot i mean uh, in our area i mean dakshina kannada kasargod and uh, most part of uh, the south canara uh, region you can uh, the common ayuras are very common so you can uh, uh, even though if you can't see the bird definitely i am sure uh, you can hear the calls because they are uh, mimicking lot of other birds call and uh, next one is jungle babbler the babbler uh, the word itself it uh, the tells us that uh, it's not a silent bird uh, when it is active it makes so much noise that uh, you, uh, you cannot ignore that bird uh, if you are a bird watcher so that is jungle babbler and uh, it's also called as seven sisters sometimes because uh, most of the time there will be seven Prashanta Hello Shamata Hello, Shamata. 
హలో హలో ప్రశాంత యు ఆర్ ఆడిబుల్ యువర్ స్క్రీన్ ఈస్ నాట్ షేరింగ్ నౌ యువర్ స్క్రీన్ ఆఫ్ నౌ 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 నో నాట్ యర్ now is it visible yes it is visible okay i think uh, somebody muted me or something uh, i am audible now right yeah you are audible now okay. you are, your screen sharing was off in between and you got muted okay okay till uh, you have um, uh-huh. uh, spoken till uh, jungle babbler Okay, okay we were uh, listening till the sure sure okay i will i will i think somebody's video is on now can you turn it off yeah, yeah. Please, uh, everyone please uh, off your video please uh so uh i think yeah. uh, i covered about uh, jungle babbler and next we will move move on towards uh, this kingfisher so this is uh, stork bill kingfisher and you can easily differentiate stork bill kingfisher from uh, white throated kingfisher or common kingfisher which are uh, uh, common in our area stork bill kingfisher is having a reddish thick beak and a yellowish uh, abdomen and the bluish back so it's easy to identify that bird in field and next we will move on to uh, the scaly breasted munia uh where you can see the scales in the breast region i mean scaly feathers in the breast region and uh, uh, if you look at the beak it's made for eating grains so when you check uh, the beaks of all the birds uh, you can uh, fairly come to know that uh, that beak is made for some activity the bird requires so uh the next one is a red whiskered bulbul i was uh, telling you here and there uh, and it's a very common bird and uh, i think all of you can uh, d- uh, identify that bird and i am not going to explain how to identify other birds because we will have some other session for that and now uh, i will move on to why birds matter why we have to do bird watching uh, that's the uh, kind of question we will get when we start bird watching because uh, when we uh, go for field with our camera and binoculars uh, especially our uh, parents or our neighbors will ask why do you go for birding what is the uh, what is there in it for you but uh, we can answer like uh, the birds are effective pest controllers uh, uh, we'll be seeing especially the bee bee eaters and other birds they are eating bees and other insects so even uh, the bulbuls and other birds they eat lot of insects per day and that's how they control the uh, pest population uh, and next thing is they are uh, some birds are pollinators like uh, sunbirds and uh, uh, some birds are important agent for seed dispersal especially the uh, fruit eating birds like uh, vernal hanging parrot or uh, uh, hill minas and all uh, even the uh, hornbills they are uh, very very uh, good seed dispersing agents because uh, they eat uh, one fruit in a tree and they fly off uh, for another region where they defecate uh, uh, and that seed will grow in that region so how like that the forest floor will be uh, emerging in that region also and a uh, few birds are uh, scavenge acts act as uh, scavengers especially the vultures vultures uh, we don't have that much activity nowadays here uh, and also the crows and black kites brahmini kites and all they have turned into scavenger uh, uh, in into scavenging uh, activities now now 
uh, and next thing is uh, keeping ecological balance by becoming prey for other organism i mean uh, the smaller birds become prey for the bigger birds uh, the warblers and other smaller birds become prey for uh, the larger birds like hawks eagles uh, and other uh, uh, even the mammals also and uh, nowadays we have to talk about the economic benefits also now the bird watching in india is become a, a profitable business uh, in kerala if you see tattekkad region and also uh, in um, northeastern region if you see there are lot of organization uh, which can organizes uh, bird watching tours so uh, birds are uh, their uh, birds yield their uh, daily bread like that so they are uh, ben beneficial economically also and a uh, very important thing is they are so much integrated with our lives so every religious book mentions about one or the other bird uh, if you consider uh, quran bible or uh, bhagavad gita everywhere or uh, in uh, any mythology any religious mythology if, if you consider there will be mention of at least one or the other bird so uh, they are uh, integrated in our system so birds uh, birds matter to us and uh, how we can um, conserve and uh, about uh, document documenting the birds uh, the conservation issue mainly comes because we are having trouble with the uh, habitat loss uh, habitat loss habitat loss is causing severe threat for birds uh, uh, if you consider the migratory species uh, they will come to one wetland one year and next time when they come to that wetland they will see some uh, 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 some buildings or some flats or some agricultural land over there so people are turning uh, forest area into uh, agricultural area or uh, wetland area into some uh, uh, business uh, yielding area like that and so the birds are losing their habitat and that's a main threat and uh, nowadays hunting and poaching has become uh, slightly less compared to the olden days because uh, uh, i think maybe the need is need has become less or uh, the people are educated not to do that thing so uh, we can we can just ignore that thing hunting and poaching but even in some part of uh, uh, kerala and karnataka we will still see that hunting uh, the main victims of uh, hunting main hunting are uh, the jungle fowls and all uh, Uh, predation by pet animals this is the growing threat now because uh, most of the people are uh, rearing pets and they become dangerous as uh, they go to the nesting site of the bird and they will destroy the eggs or they will eat the eat the hatchling like that and uh, other thing is the climate change i don't have to explain that because everybody knows about climate change uh, we are facing lot of trouble uh because of climate change not only birds uh, but ourselves are facing that and how to document the birds uh birds prashant bhai again uh, screen sharing is off Uh, Shamat, I think uh, the network is not stable for you. I think maybe. Yeah. Now uh, the screen is visible. No, no, not yet, Prasanth. now we, i think it's visible right 
uh, is it visible now shamata not not yet yeah now it's visible okay uh, so yeah uh, you can document the birds using ebird i naturalist indian biodiversity portal and uh, you can just upload your photos in social medias so that they will be collected uh, somewhere and uh, in future scientists can uh, uh, just look into your uh, data and uh, analyze them and uh, even the participating in various citizen science programs like uh, great backyard bird count uh, and o number bird count like uh, and uh, uh, endemic bird day like that you can input your data so that it will help in the future like that uh, if you are not conserving the birds directly you can just become a citizen scientist and you can document the things and that will definitely help the real scientists in the field to uh, analyze and uh, uh, do the conservation needs and now uh, we will look into some interesting bird behaviors uh, here you can see a a uh, male peacock with its beautiful train train means the feather feathers and uh, it's uh, attracting the females uh, it it is trying to attract the females around so uh, there are uh, competitions for uh, uh, one uh, a male uh, because there will be plenty of uh, other males around and uh, it has to show its uh, full capacity to attract the female like that uh, in most of the birds they have to attract the females by one or the other thing you might be uh, seen uh, the videos of uh, uh, birds of paradise from papua new guinea uh, they are very uh, very much quite uh, quite interesting behavioral adaptations and in india i think uh, uh, maybe we can say only the peacock is the one bird which shows that kind of uh, tactic um i will look into uh, some interesting things about uh, bird behaviors the first of uh, first of all is bird migration uh when you see uh, when you go for bird watching in rainy season i mean the season now you are uh, getting only the resident birds resident birds in the sense the birds which uh, spend their prashanta yeah, it yeah. again when yes i think uh, uh, the network is very much unstable that's why now now is it visible no now visible right yeah yeah ah it's visible now uh, i am sorry all the participants because of uh, uh, the network issue i am facing very much uh, uh, trouble here so sorry and bear with me and uh, about bird migration now uh, when you go for birding in the rainy rainy season uh, you will get uh, to see the resident birds and when you go for birding in the summer or uh, in the winter time you will see lot of other birds in your area and that's because some birds will visit your area in the time of winter and they will be coming from a long distance like uh, maybe uh, russia siberia or uh, european countries and uh, this migration happens because uh, the the original place of the bird i mean the breeding area will become unsuitable for their living so uh, maybe because of uh, unavailability of food or uh, the favorable hab habitat or any other environmental condition will make them to move 
to other areas in search of food or favorable habitat and uh, they will come to your place that's a uh, brief thing about uh, migration and uh, there are a uh, few migration highways in the world like east asian australian highway australasia highway the american flyway uh, african Eura eurasian flyway etc uh, these are the flyways where uh, most number of uh, species will fly and uh, reach one place uh, reach one uh, the particular place i mean uh, if you consider east asian australian flyway uh, most of the birds we, what we get in india are because of that flyway and uh, african eurasian flyway uh, the birds from uh, europe or uh, that uh, siberia that region they will come through some particular path and that path is the flyway uh, and in, when they fly in that path they will get lot of hurdles i mean uh, uh, the himalayan region or uh, the different kind of uh, weather conditions uh, they have to uh, withstand that and they have to reach the end destination uh, for uh, for that i will give one example like bar headed geese i think uh, most of you might have seen them uh, in facebook or other uh, platforms this bar headed geese travel through himalayas and uh, it is the bird which flies to a uh, very much uh, high, highest altitude i mean uh, no other bird can fly in that altitude because of uh, lack of oxygen Uh, level in the atmosphere and uh, the temperature there but bar headed bar headed geese can travel through himalayas and can reach our area so that's the kind of uh, thing uh, which makes them very special and uh, you might be knowing about amur falcon uh, maybe 2 3 years back there was lot of uh, thing going around amur falcon because they were uh, massacred in uh, in the northeastern region uh, they are uh, traveling from uh, uh, they are traveling through china and they will reach some uh, part of northeastern region and there they will congregate in such huge number that uh, they, they will be like uh, some uh, uh, pests there so people used to Uh, catch the bird and they used to uh, feed the uh, eat the bird and also used to sell the birds so after some cons uh, conservationists intervened the process and uh, gradually by educating the people around there the, they almost stopped poaching and hunting there so uh, the amur falcons can fly through india and reach their final destination that is south africa Uh, even uh, in our area we can find amur falcons nowadays because uh, 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 i have seen them near my home that is gumpe hill uh, maybe every year they come in this way some birds come in this way so uh, in particular time i mean uh, maybe around december to february there are uh, many chances of getting them in our field uh, and why they do migration and how they are uh, 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 how they are becoming habitual for migration that's why uh, there are a lot of studies are going on but still scientists don't know what exactly causes the migration uh, they but they, they will say that uh, genetical programming genetic programming makes them uh, like look uh, they look for the destiny i mean if uh, in the slide you can see a gargani gargani uh, so uh, if it wants to reach kasaragod uh, a lake in the kasaragod then the, a genetical program which made it to uh, fly in that direction and reach this south, southern india india part of southern india so uh, and also uh, interestingly they use uh, the magnet uh, magnetic force of the earth and also they use sun as a compass and they judge the uh, the direction and the distance of flight
some birds will fly uh, continuously or uh, some birds will fly uh, in uh, longer distance i mean uh, uh, maybe uh, one one bird i forgot it uh, flies continuously up to 11000 kilometers without food or fresh uh, and some birds especially especially like uh, amur falcon they follow their food food i mean uh, uh, same time when the amur falcons migration starts there will be another migration of dragonflies uh, I, uh, i forgot the particular species of the dragon, dragonfly they are food for that amur falcon the, so they, when the, whenever uh, uh, this dragonfly starts to move amur falcon follows them and try to uh, feed on them so this dragonflies travel through india and reach south africa and breed there and uh, the same same manner the uh, amur falcon will travel in that way and reach south africa so uh, they will get enough food at that, that time but their homeland will be having uh, un unfavorable weather condition and all and uh, there are some other type of migration in the short distance migration or altitudinal migration uh, this altitudinal migration is called as uh, leap frog migration especially the uh, there was a study recently uh, uh, where the crimson, crimson back sunbird uh, which was uh, uh, studied and uh, uh, the habit of it which was showed that uh, it was flying to higher altitude of western ghat in some part of the year and it will uh, descend when the uh, favorable condition attains in the lower part so that is called leap frog migration even if you observe uh, uh, black kites or uh, uh, our uh, small green beaters they will fly to other areas to breed and they will come back when the favorable condition attains here i mean when here uh, uh, here if it is the rainy season they will go to other places for breeding and they will come back once the winter season starts i mean the august and or september is the beginning for all the migrants to come here and uh, uh, this is about the uh, migration and thing and there are vagrant birds or nomadism uh, sometimes what happens is whenever we go to field we will see some exotic bird in our area uh, like uh, it is uh, if a bird has to be seen in uh, northern part of india if it is found in southern part of india then it can be a vagrant bird uh, that is it missed its uh, pathway or uh, because of some uh, genetical dysfunctionality it lost uh, its original route or uh, a final destination and it ended up in our place that's called vagrant uh, they are vagrant birds or they are nomadic i mean they don't have exact destination or exact route to travel so uh, then the birders will be really lucky to see them so that's about bird migration and next about uh, i will talk about little bit about uh, pelagic birds and uh, these pelagic birds also uh, for our indian part they are almost all are uh, migratory birds and they spend uh, spend their entire uh, almost entire life in the uh, sea or ocean itself only for breeding they will come to shore or uh, the land uh, here first of all uh, first one first bird you are seeing is arctic arctic skua or it's called as a parasitic zigger uh, it's called as parasitic zigger means it is a parasitic bird that means it steals food from other bird uh, when you go for pelagic birding uh, uh, i forgot to explain what is pelagic pelagic birds are the birds which are seen inside uh, when you go inside the sea or ocean they does, doesn't come to the shore uh, in normal condition they only come to shore for breeding so uh, there are a lot of pelagic birds like uh, uh, skuas storm petrels boobies and uh, many other birds uh, and some terns gulls also go inside uh, uh, travel uh, long distance inside the sea to capture prey and these skuas will follow the gulls or terns to 
uh, capture the prey which which were caught by the girls or turns they will chase the girl and uh, they uh, create a lot of irritation in the girls or turns and uh, finally the girl or turns uh, just gives up and throws its food and these are uh, skuas will catch that food and eat them eat it so that's why they are called parasite parasitic zigar or uh, and that uh, that kind of behavior is called kleptoparasitism kleptoparasitism uh, i mean the uh, disturbing others or uh, yeah uh, troubling others to uh, keep our ourselves happy maybe that's uh, is some kind of uh, funny definition for a kleptoparasitism so uh, that's the parasitic zigar and one more is the wilson storm petrel uh, uh, this is a very small bird and uh, it's having very interesting behavior so, uh, uh, in the uh, 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 ocean floor or sea floor it will pat its leg and uh, because of its small leg the uh, shrimps or crustaceans inside the sea will feel that uh, some food is coming uh, and they will try to catch the leg of the bird but the bird itself catches that uh, crustaceans or shrimps which try to attack its leg that uh, that's uh, uh, A, a very much interesting behavior done by Vince Wilson's storm petrel. Uh, they are not easy to see in the uh, sea floor. Uh, if you are very keen and uh, if you are lucky, then only you can see them in the uh, uh, sea floor because the color of them uh, will almost look exactly like the color of the sea or ocean. So uh, next thing is uh, flight of. Uh, flight of raptors and hovering of kingfisher uh usually a uh, flight of raptors you might be uh, uh, you might observe the uh, flight behavior of raptors they usually uh, don't flap their wings they usually glide through the air and uh, that gliding mechanism is because of the thermals the thermals are uh, like a hot current of air which are moving from uh, earth to the top i mean uh, when the sun is bright and uh, the air becomes hot the density of the hot air will be less compared to the density of the normal air so the hot air will move up and the raptors they use this kind of thermals to glide and uh, till 1990s even no scientist in the world knew about this thing and later they used this thermal technique for uh, some flight or uh, some uh, hot air balloon kind of things and uh, this thing about uh, flight of raptors very interesting behavior that is and uh, about the hovering technique of uh, kingfishers kestrels and some other birds uh, they will uh, open up all the feathers in their wings and they will flap very near to their body so that uh, 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 the aerodynamics will be like that and uh, they will stay in a constant position for a longer time they will be uh, flying but they will be in constant position and uh, they will be searching for the prey or uh, they will be uh, searching for a perfect time to launch their attack uh, that's why they hover Uh, usually the uh, birds which are uh, which will be hovering are uh, pied kingfisher and uh, many kingfisher species will do that and in raptors you will see smaller lap, uh, raptors like uh, uh, kestrels uh, some uh, goshawks and all they will also hover and next thing i want to uh, discuss about is uh, some things about owl um generally uh, for bird watchers it's okay but for uh, non bird watchers the owl is not an uh, interesting creature or or uh, they won't welcome owl in their house or uh, any apartment or uh, shops because they think that uh, that's a bad omen uh, 
uh, but usually the owls are very much uh, good in uh, predating our uh, uh, rodents and other pests uh, recently there was a study from lakshadweep island in our uh, uh, indian uh, territory lakshadweep island uh, there was a, a lot of disturbances by uh, these rodents and they introduced barn owl there and because of this barn owl uh, the the prey uh, prey population i mean the rodent population come come down to a drastic level and that nuisance has reduced there so uh, that's the kind of effect we can see uh, there and i don't say the invasiveness i mean introduction of a species is a good good for ecosystem i am i will never say that because if you introduce a species which is not there then it will definitely create some problem in future but what i am trying to say is the owls are very much beneficial for our ecosystem and uh, there are uh, many uh, interesting facts about owl and they can rotate their head to 270 degree i mean they can't rotate to 360 degree but they uh, they can rotate their head up to 270 degree that's because uh, their eye eye uh, balls are not like our eyeballs or uh, other birds uh, eyeballs uh, uh, they are like tubular structure and they are fixed there so they can't move their eyes so they have to turn their head entirely and uh, they can do that because they have uh, some specialized mechanism to pump the blood to their brain otherwise if we turn 270 degree then our neck will break and we will die but owls will not so that's uh, some interesting facts about uh, owls and uh, uh, usually we will get uh, here some fish owls wood owl and uh, some other smaller owls like uh, spotted owl like jungle owl like uh, etc they are very beautiful and uh, very uh, interesting creatures and they are most most of the owls are uh, nocturnal uh, only few species like jungle owls will be active during the day time and uh, i will just briefly explain about bird calls because uh, they are also very important bird behavior uh, bird calls they uh, uh, th there are two types i can say one is call one is song calls are uh, used for uh, communicating with group members or uh, uh, for displaying some threats and uh, uh, just to uh, i can say they are uh, used for communication itself and uh, one more thing is uh, there is a call which scientists uh, observed as mobbing calls and mobbing calls are the calls where the bird uh, calls and it tries to attract other individuals of its own group or uh, other uh, similar group to uh, chase away the predator which approaches it that's mobbing call usually we will see some crows uh, chasing away some uh, big eagle or uh, uh, brahmin kite uh, kind of things uh, because uh, they uh, that time they their call will be different so the other birds will uh, other birds of the same species or different species will come to know that uh, this uh, the calling bird is uh, in trouble and they they will join and they will try to chase away the prey that's a mo that's mobbing call and a bird songs is different uh, usually uh, in the morning time you will hear songs of uh, puff throated babbler very long song and that's because a uh, uh they usually do uh, they usually song because uh they have to attract the female or they have to defend the territory so a uh, female will uh, look into the call, call and uh, uh, check for better mate the better call then the better mate like that it will uh, it is there in uh, it is the nature's policy and also for defending the territory if you if a bird calls from one place and it uh, it will be heard from somewhat longer distance and if someone tries to approach that area and hears that call then it will move away that area so 
like that it it will uh, defend its territory and uh, we'll observe some uh, not calls it's called drumming of woodpecker when it hits over a uh, dry dried wood or something so that is a drumming and uh, each woodpecker is having its own frequent frequency of drumming so by ob observing or hearing the drumming you can identify the woodpecker which is making that drumming so uh, in our field uh, visits myself and maxim we come across uh, uh, drumming of rufous woodpecker it was very uh, the frequency was very high so that uh, uh, in the beginning we, uh, we were unable to uh, think that it was because it was done by rufous woodpecker we thought uh, the larger bird uh, larger bird like uh, white bellied woodpecker is making that drumming but later uh, once in a once in the field we observed rufous woodpecker making that drumming so we came to know that the smaller small uh, smaller bird also can make so uh, the drumming in that much high frequency and interestingly the snipes snipes in the wetlands can also make the drumming noise a drumming means that uh, they will rub their uh, tail feathers uh, in the uh, time of their uh, courtship and that will create some kind of sound and that's also called drumming okay uh, and next uh, about mimicry there are a lot of birds doing mimicry mimicry is the thing where one bird imitates the call of the other <clears throat> usually uh, the mimicry is seen in uh, case of drongos uh, racket tail drongo uh, bronze drongo acid drongo and other dr black drongos they will mimic lot of other birds even uh, our golden fronted leaf birds and uh, ayoras they are also capable of mimicking other birds so uh, for the beginners if you try to hear the calls then if there are, there is a mimicry bird then you will definitely uh, will uh, uh, get confused with the call or the species i mean if uh, a, a racket tail drongo is mimicking a call of shikra shikra is a bird bird of prey if it's mimicking the call of shikra and if you go to field and look uh, look out for shikra then you definitely won't find shikra there you will just see racket tail drongo uh doing its own business or calling like shikra and that's about mimicry and we will have a session on this bird calls so uh, one more thing i wanted to mention is uh, the uh, red wattle lapwing i think you must have observed near your house and all when we go near its habitat or uh, mostly if it is uh, if it laid eggs on uh, rocky crevices and all then it will try to mob you it will uh, call uh, in a very high pitch uh, uh, frequency and it will try to mob you that's a kind of uh, threatening call i mean uh, it is it also got some fear and it also wants to chase away us so uh, that's kind of call for chasing away the uh, predators or uh, approaching disturbances and uh, next about the mixed flock hunting uh, mixed flock hunting is very interesting behavior seen in birds where uh, uh, there will be lot of birds uh, they will be together and they will be hunting in group and uh, uh, the benefic uh, beneficials will be uh, benefic uh, benefits of that will be like uh, there will be some nuclear birds like uh, racket tail drongo or uh, uh brown cheeked falveta uh, they will be leading that group and they will be very much uh, uh thorough about the surroundings and they will warn about the approaching predators so other birds which are uh, going with them will immediately become uh, uh, uh they can defend themselves easily so uh, that's the benefit of uh, mixed flock hunting uh there will be many species which will gather together and do this mixed flock hunting i have seen uh, uh, the, uh usually we will see this in forest kind of habitat uh, and uh, the nuclear is the lead birds i mean uh, most 
probably the lead lead birds will be drone goes or that kind of birds which can attack or which can chase away the pre predator or which can warn about the ap approaching predator so that others will be alert uh, and uh, yeah more eyes to watch for the predators is a benefit and cost will be sometimes if uh, one warbler is uh, catching a prey that uh, racketail drongo can come that come there and uh, catch uh, uh, this warbler prey and uh, uh, fly fly back so uh, there is also the kleptoparasitism so that is the cost of uh, this mixed flock hunting but it is beneficial for them because they can uh, uh, they will be more aware about their surroundings and uh, they can uh, hunt on their own without any uh, uh, much fear of uh, surroundings and that is about mixed flock hunting and about nest building i will say uh, there are few types of nest uh, 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 one is scrape nest scrape nest is the nest where uh, bird will not uh, bring any uh, sticks or uh, tools but uh, just like uh, some uh, in between some stones or uh, pellets they will lay their eggs and uh, they will incubate there itself like uh, we see in in the case of uh, red wattle lap lapwing lapwing species and uh, in case of mound nest mound is the thing where they will pile up uh, uh, some dead and decaying organic matters or some soil and in, in, uh, in inside that mound they will lay their eggs so uh, there will be extra uh, caring effect i mean uh, predators won't attack easily or uh, that dead and de decaying matters will give some kind of temperature that is required for their uh, eggs to hatch or that is the ambient temperature and uh, these kind of nests are observed in case of uh, flamingos or uh, and some other kind of birds which are uh, in indian birds i don't think there are uh, many birds which do these kind of uh, nests and cavities cavities are the uh, nest types where uh, these woodpeckers and uh, their kinds will live the, uh, you can see uh, white cheek barbet coming out of uh, cavity and uh, uh, usually woodpeckers will do their own hole and uh, in some cases like uh, the case of malabar trogon they can't uh, uh, malabar trogon or uh, uh, this one hornbill they can't uh, hold the or dig the dried part dried wood part but they will select some uh, cavities in the tree or holes in the tree where uh, it is suitable for their nest uh, that's about the cavities and about burrows uh, if you see the nests of uh, kingfishers then they will be uh, in the burrows of uh, uh, some la uh, uh, land edges so uh, they will dig burrow in uh, uh, if it is a loose soil they can easily dig burrows there in the land edges and they will nest there and about cup nest i was mentioning about uh, black naped monarch it will, the beautiful nest of it is like cup cup shaped so uh, usually they, uh, that will be built by some grass material and also it uses lichens or uh, other materials to uh, make it uh, very much comfortable and also it uses spider silk to uh, in inside so it it will give some flexi flexibleness to the nest so uh, the uh, eggs and the hatchling and the mother which is incubating can be accommodated in that nest and uh, uh, many birds around us will do these kind of nests and the pendant nest which is very uh, specific to some kind of birds like baya weaver birds um, if you talk about baya weaver there are a lot of things because uh, uh, people say that baya weaver population is decreasing day by day but uh, we don't know the exact uh, situation out there uh, we have uh, we have we have to document them and a uh, very important thing about uh, baya weaver's nest is they will make some uh, compartments inside the nest 
so one compartment is for uh, egg laying one for uh, staying one for adult like that that's a beautiful uh, engineering by these birds and about platform nest uh, if you see uh, larger uh, species like vultures or uh, eagles they will just build uh, build a nest in uh, uh, higher and uh, higher canopy and uh, that that will not be having any particular shape they will just uh, pile up some woods or stacks and that's the platform nest even some birds like uh, eurasian coot which can be seen here the black bird in the first image that's a uh, platform nest in the lake lake or pond so uh, a few birds like uh, eurasian coot and some uh, uh, duck species will do platform nest in the water so that's about nest building and with this kind of different nesting you can identify the bird itself but you should not disturb the bird or you should not try to approach them you can try capturing them by uh, from long uh, longer distance without any disturbance to the bird and and uh, i i want to tell you about uh, hornbill because I, i am discussing about some info, interesting behaviors of birds uh this uh, story of hornbill goes like uh, uh uh our in in our area we will see hornbills like malabar grey hornbill uh, they are small hornbills but when we go to uh, the areas like tattikkad or uh, uh, dandeli in karnataka we will see the larger hornbills like uh, uh, great hornbill and all uh, they their beaks will be very heavy and uh, because of that their uh, axial and atlas vertebrae in the neck region will be fused up so that they can withstand the weight of that beak because that beak will be heavy and uh, uh, there is an extra growth in the beak that's called cask that will help uh, to uh, enhance the uh, sound or call created by the bird uh, but we don't see that cas in our malabar grey hornbill or indian grey hornbill and uh, important thing about uh, hornbills are they are monogamous birds monogamous means uh, they uh, stay with one female i mean one family for entire lifetime and they use uh, a nesting site and they are regularly using they will be regularly using that uh, uh, nesting site for many uh, years if there is, there is no uh, disturbance or uh, there is no habitat destruction and when the nesting uh, time comes this uh, females will go inside a tree uh, tree hole or cavity and it will uh, conceal itself there and only some portion of the uh, tree hole will be visible uh, i mean they will uh, uh, put some uh, uh, some uh, soil content or uh, something to cover up the uh, uh, hole or cavity of the uh, tree and only some portion of the uh, cavity will be open where female can uh, 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 female will uh, put its beak inside and male will transfer some food materials to female so the entire nesting time so in the entire nesting time the female and the hatchlings will be inside this uh, cavity and it cannot come outside so if and it entirely depends on the male bird for the food uh, food so if the male bird dies outside there are very less chance for the female and hatchlings to survive inside but there are instances that uh, the female bird opening the uh, uh, the cavity up and coming outside and feeding the young ones there are instances and there are other conservationists who are working towards uh, uh, conservation of great hornbills where if the male bird dies then <coughs> they will only go and feed the uh, female bird and hatchling so that uh, they are helping uh, their uh, their population to grow up so that's about uh, the story of uh, hornbill so uh, there will be uh, the female spends entire time of nesting inside tree hole concealed 
and that's uh, one kind of uh, motherhood i can say so uh, and other things uh, interesting things like uh, aerial hunting if you observe uh, birds like asian palm swift or other swift or swallows you will see they moving uh, uh, them moving very uh, with very high speed in the air and you you won't observe anything but they will be catching their prey and all they are very speed in uh, very fast in their moving and they will catch their uh, uh, predators i mean uh, they will catch small insect and all in the flight itself they don't have to uh, land or uh, uh, come down to catch the prey and uh, there are some swift or swallows they uh, they are known to sleep when they are uh, flying because uh, some uh, most of the uh, swifts and sw uh, swifts they are uh, known for migration so uh, when they do long uh, journey they they have to sleep but they don't uh, they can't come down uh, because uh, they if they come down on ground or any surfaces they will be vulnerable for uh, predators uh, attack so they will be flying only and sleeping there itself and that's the very interesting thing about the swifts and swallows even ni our night jars and fly catchers do the same thing their uh, acrobatics will be so much uh, so much sophisticated that they can easily capture prey and in uh, maybe uh, in fraction of second i mean about 50 60 seconds if they uh, fly from one place they will come again to that place with the bee or uh, some insect with in their uh, mouth beak so that's about the aerial hunting technique they, they are aerodynamically very strong and uh, uh, their evolution is such that they are uh, uh, very well uh, developed for uh, uh, catching prey in the air and about uh, strikes and other ferocious birds uh, usually uh, strikes are uh, known uh, strikes and other uh, birds like uh, strikes are uh, butcher birds they are uh, known for their ferocious behavior uh, these strikes will catch a prey and uh, if that prey is uh, somewhat poisonous then it will uh, hang that prey in the thorny shrub or uh, any kind of surface for uh, some days so that that uh, uh, poisonous thing will go out and uh, 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 brown shrike uh, or shrike can eat that without any uh, danger and also if uh, if it is not hungry or uh, if it if it gets plenty of prey together then it will catch the prey there and uh, at that time and it will uh, hang that prey in the thorny bushes and after uh, one or two days when it uh, requires the food then it will go there and eat that prey so that's one kind of uh, pretty behavior seen in uh, shrikes and uh, if you look at kingfishers uh, you would think that kingfishers are uh, uh, only they will go for hunting uh, uh, fishes but not like that the white throated kingfisher what we see is very very much uh, uh, notorious sometimes they will kill smaller birds like uh, tailor birds or prinias and uh, that's an uh, astonishing behavior so uh, and uh, the, the very interesting part is about uh, brood parasitism uh, i have mentioned about uh, kleptoparasitism and this is about brood parasitism what you mean by brood parasitism is there are some birds which don't want to grow their young ones on their own but they want their young ones but they don't want to rear their young ones but they will keep their eggs with in some other birds nest and uh, they will leave it there and that uh, the uh, where they will keep the nest that bird is known as host and this one is the uh, parasitic bird usually in india we will see lot of uh, cuckoos which are uh, brood parasitic and even the coel indian coel is also a parasitic bird uh, in case of uh, 
uh, here you can see one photograph of uh, banded bay cuckoo juvenile fed by common iora a uh, common iora so uh, in case of this you can uh, just uh, differentiate the size of banded bay cuckoo and common iora uh, there are lot of interesting theories behind this brood parasitism and uh, i will slightly take a few minutes to explain that before that there are two types of uh, brood parasitic parasitism one is facultative and another one is obligate parasitism uh, facultative means uh, sometimes bird will feel that uh, i can rear some of my eggs on their uh, uh, my own i can rear some of eggs but i don't want to rear all the eggs so they will keep some eggs in other uh, uh, birds nest uh maybe that is interspecific maybe uh, interspecific means the nest of same species or intraspecific means nest of different species uh, that's facultative means uh, it will rear its it can rear its young ones but uh, sometimes it will uh, uh, lay their eggs in others nest and uh, it will uh, leave them and obligate parasite is para parasites means uh, they they don't build nest or they don't lay their eggs on their own nest or something like that they just uh, when their breeding season comes after mating they will lay their eggs uh, nest uh, eggs in uh, some different host nest and they will leave it there that's obligate parasite uh, parasitism and uh, there are interspecific and intraspecific interspecific means sometimes if you see uh, the common crows they will lay their uh, eggs in some other common crows nest and they will leave it there so that's interspecific parasitism brood parasitism intraspecific means uh, the photo what you are seeing is an example for intraspecific banded bay uh, banded bay cuckoo mother lay, laid their egg in iora's nest and iora is rearing that chick that's intraspecific and here uh, comes the story of brood parasitism uh, you might be thinking how come this small bird rearing that uh, entirely different looking bird uh, that's maybe because of uh, uh, the first thing is when brood parasitic bird lays the egg in host nest it must be sure that the host will not throw away the intruder's nest so there will be egg mimicry i mean if uh, uh, the uh, common iora's eggs are having some uh, some color i mean uh, for example if it is blue in color then definitely the banded bay cuckoo's eggs will be also having that color or uh, if it is having some uh, black spots over that then uh, most of the time the banded bay cuckoo's eggs will also have the same almost same similar looking black spots so that a uh, common iora cannot distinguish between its own egg and the parasitic eggs and after that once uh, uh, eggs hatch there will be nestling mimicry and uh, that's a very interesting thing which scientists are trying to understand uh, in there are some cases where uh, these nestlings will call in some uh, they call in some different way so that uh, these common iora or some host mothers will mothers or fathers will think that oh this uh, this is a poor bird i want to feed it and uh, uh, even though it's a, uh, it's not its own species it will feed it and uh, it will rear it and uh, that's a nest, nestling mimicry i can say and interestingly this uh, in the case of eggs this brood parasitic eggs they will have thicker shells compared to this uh, host egg that's because sometimes if the host uh, decides to throw away the uh, uh, some unidentified eggs i mean if it uh, smells some uh, uh, intruders eggs then it will try to uh, throw away the nest at that time if by chance if it is if it throws away its own eggs and if it if, uh, if it uh, uh, then at that time if the, there there will be any damages to this egg it 
uh, that damage won't happen that much easily like uh, the damage which can happen to the host eggs itself because host eggs will be uh, host egg shells will be thin compared to the parasitic eggs so the durability of uh, uh, this uh, brood parasitic birds eggs will be more so uh, and uh, this is about evolution uh, how these two birds are uh, uh, evolving with each other is very uh, one kind of very interesting uh, behavior i mean uh, how uh, the banded bay cuckoo's egg resembles the egg of uh, common iora we don't know uh, there's some kind of uh, genetic uh, thing and uh, that coevolution did that and uh, usually uh, if you uh, think about why uh, uh, this host will not throw away the eggs of uh, uh, this parasitic birds because uh, there will be lot of chances where uh, uh, destroying their own eggs by trying to throw away the parasitic eggs so usually they won't go for that but uh, ultimately they have to suffer the loss because uh, after the hatchling comes this uh, cuckoo will uh, just kick off the rest of the eggs which were laid by host itself and just uh, it will be alone and it will be uh, fed by uh, these uh, parents profusely so it will grow easy, uh, very fast and easily uh, that's uh, the thing about uh, brood parasitism and uh, these things are uh, almost common but uh, we are not observing that i can say because uh, in recent in couple of uh, recent years there are a lot of documents documentations of these kind of behaviors i'm just mentioning about banded bay cuckoo here but there are a uh, lot of cuckoos in uh, our country like common cuckoo uh, common hawk cuckoo uh, large hawk cuckoo and uh, in south northeastern countries there are a lot of cuckoos emerald cuckoo and all they are all parasitic and they are dependent on other birds and uh, one one thing i wanted to tell is uh, some birds are specific to their host and uh, uh, these parasitic birds they want to lay their eggs on that single species or only few related species otherwise their eggs will be identified the identified by the prey and in uh, uh, foreign countries there are birds like uh, uh, cow birds but they are uh, generalistic about brood parasitism they lay their eggs in different kind of hosts and they try uh, their chances like that but in india i don't think there are uh, any uh, kind of generalistic birds they are host specific so uh, that's about uh, brood parasitism and uh, at last about a uh, few uh, things about mantling and murmuration mantling is a behavior seen in raptors uh, when the raptor catches a prey and it it is eating that prey if some other raptor approaches it then it will widen off its wings and try to protect its meal that's the behavior called mantling so uh, if you go to field then you will observe lot of interesting behaviors like this so uh, even we can correlate that thing with ourselves when we are uh, when we are uh, children we will try uh, uh, sometimes we will try to uh, eat the chocolate by ourselves ourselves not to uh, we don't uh, don't like to give it to our uh, sisters or our friends so uh, that's kind of thing which which can be observed in uh, in the case of raptors that's called mantling and one more thing is uh, in case of uh, starlings especially uh, rosy starlings we will see a lot of congregation i mean congregation means uh, they will group up there will be uh, lakhs of birds in some uh, some uh, places there will be lakhs of birds they will be uh, joined together and they will form they will fly in the evening time and they will make some different uh, uh, 
uh, different kind of shapes that's called murmuration and scientists uh, don't know why they are uh, doing this maybe because uh, they want to uh, escape from uh, uh, predators or is there any uh, other benefits from this kind of murmuration they don't know and they are uh, trying to understand the physics behind this murmuration also because uh, this murmuration will uh, when we observe that murmuration we will see that uh, lightness and darkness in uh, different time intervals so uh, whether that is uh, important for that bird we don't know so uh, th there are still studies going on about this murmuration so like this there are many lot of interesting behaviors in uh, in birds which we can only see when we go to field and observe them for longer time and uh, when you try to analyze it then you will come to know the reason behind it or uh, why do they do like that so uh, this is about uh, interesting behaviors and uh, so finally we can save ourselves when we try to save our fellow beings and thank you thank you for listening thank you thank you prashant um, now we can um, at 10 minutes for uh, uh, any any question and answer is it fine yes yes sure shamita uh, uh, if any question is there uh, you can always uh, chat in uh, chat in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask the question Uh, there is one question uh, by Pawan Kulakarni, which methodology we can follow for bird documentary? Uh, for the beginners, I will say there is no methodology as such. Uh, you can go anywhere you like and you can uh, try birding any place uh, you want to bird. And for if you want to do some research kind of thing, then there are some methodologies like transect uh, survey method and some others are there. Uh, that you have uh, there. Uh, there will be some uh, procedures or uh, some uh, detailed descriptions like where you have to do birding at what time, uh, the time inter for, uh, interval for birding that you have to follow. So. Uh, yeah, uh, documentary means, uh, I think, uh, uh, if I am correct, then you are telling that uh, to just observe the bird, I think. There are two more questions, Prashant. Okay. Just, uh, one is, uh, any recommendation for binoculars for beginners? Okay. Uh, the next one is, few books for bird watching. Okay. Uh, for... Uh, beginners uh, about binoculars i am not sure about now but i can try answering you after checking uh, some uh, doing some research online i will do that and i will let you know but i am having nikon uh, uh, binocular but right now i am not using that i am just using my camera so i am not uh, that much familiar with binoculars but binoculars are very important and uh, I can tell you uh, which are, which and all binoculars you can use for uh, uh, bird watching, and uh, uh, suggest few books for bird watching. And um, I will say for beginners, there is a book by Dr. Salim Ali about uh, uh, birds of uh, India that you can purchase, or you can go for uh, birds of Indian subcontinent by uh, authors. Carol in skip and uh, Richard Grimmett in skip and in skip. So there will there are three authors. That book is very much good and you can go for that. And if you want still more, then you can. There are a lot of uh, books like uh, book uh, uh, the uh, book by Rasmussen. That's the one one of the book which uh, all the experts will uh, use. 
So, so for the beginners, I think you can go for uh, uh, Birds of Indian Subcontinent by Dr. Salim Ali or uh, Birds of Indian Subcontinent by uh, uh, this one, uh, uh, Inskip and uh, Grimet. And uh, that one more, uh, this one, uh, uh, I don't know, remember the exact name. Uh, well, that's the by uh, Pamela Anderson and uh, Rasmussen, I think. And uh, one more question by Pawan Kulkani. What about roosting behavior in birds? Yeah. Uh, different birds are having different roosting behaviors. If you see uh, this one, uh, red whiskered bulbul, they will uh, sleep at night in some uh, uh, bushes or uh, some. Uh, normally, uh, they don't. Uh, they don't want some forest kind of thing or uh, uh, this one. Uh, even I, I have seen uh, red whiskered bulbul, Indian paradise flycatcher, and uh, some other some other birds roosting near my home. Maybe they are feeling like when humans are there near to them, uh, they are much safer than if uh, if they are uh, sleeping outside. So uh, and uh, in case of uh, green beaters, they sleep, uh, they roost in a group. Uh, I I remember one occasion in uh, uh, during my college days I, when I was doing uh, my MSc uh, in Mangalore University. Uh, I used to visit uh, visit uh, uh, there is one place called Yakshagana Kala Mandira. There I used to visit in the evening, and there I was uh, I was seeing lot of uh, green beaters in the evening. I was thinking why they are coming in that that much number. And uh, later in uh, when I visited at night for uh, looking for night jar, I found a acacia tree where. They, they were roosting. There were many in number. And here, the group, uh, the, uh, they are in groups. So the, if there are any predators, then they will confuse the predators by flying here and there or calling them. Or they can just attack on them, attack on the predators. So that is the strategy there. So uh, different birds will have different roosting behavior. So we have to uh, study that, and we don't know about uh, don't know roosting behavior of many birds. Uh, is there is two? Yeah, continue, Prasad. Yeah. Uh, is there any instrument for acoustic study of birds? Uh, yeah, there. Are, uh, acoustic study means uh, we can record using. Uh, very sophisticated mics. I mean, there are uh, mics which are used by scientists or uh, this bird call experts. They uh, that uh, that will almost diminishes the noise created in the surroundings, and they they will uh, selectively record the bird calls or the calls which you want to record. So there are. Uh, instruments and uh, we will have a session for that i think in the coming days and i am not thorough with that also uh, because uh, uh, i remember something like uh, saint answer uh, made mics are available for that and there are softwares which which are used to uh, improvise your recordings like uh, uh, there are uh, some softwares that also i i have to uh, search and i have to answer that. Uh, we will have a session for that in the coming days, like the calls, uh, mimicry, and uh, how to study the calls. We will have the session for that, and there we will discuss these things about acoustic study and all. Can you name one uh, beautiful bluebird shown in the slide while explaining platform nest, I think? Okay, one minute. I think uh, it is black-naped monarch. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, Shamata. Uh, yeah, might be that one only. So, uh, is, I think uh, it's almost over. Yeah. 
the questions are almost over um, i think over. uh sonita ms is telling kingfisher in our area will eat dragonfly as a food yes of course uh, kingfisher eats variety of foods so the it's like uh, uh it will eat fish it will eat dragonflies it will eat small birds also and i don't know i there are, i think there are some documentation of it eating some uh, small rodents also so they are ferocious that's why i mentioned it so please document these things and keep it with you or you can upload it to public platform that will be very much useful and i think that's the end of the question yes. here yeah over to you raju sir uh, for the official thank you note oh one minute i will i will unmute him uh -huh. raj sir hello yeah, yeah i can we can hear you raj sir oh okay 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 uh, so a thrilling hobby yes we are all thrilled by your wonderful session by uh, our dearest mr prashant krishna mc uh, thank you sir thank you for your uh, valuable time for this uh, uh, long two hours uh, thank you thank you thank you raju sir and uh, thank you all and sorry for uh, this uh, i had many technical glitches i know but very sorry for that i think uh, rest of the session was okay and audible i think yeah prashant it, it was it was audible after that yes. and uh, i will i am uh, i'm happy to extend uh, our uh, thanks from kasaragod birders to all the participants who has patiently listening to our webinar thank you uh, thank you participants and we we one more uh, we, we will be we will be we will be having this webinars uh, now and then uh, please extend your uh, helping hands and please join us for the webinars coming webinar thank you thank you kahele pitti galile Can we close? Uh, yes, 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 sure. Yeah. Ma, quarter ten. Good meeting. Last talk. I should.